Uh, okay, so uh, thanks uh, for coming to my talk. The talk is on temporal concept localization on videos, uh, specifically on a data set called YouTube ATEM. So before I begin, this is joint effort from a layer six team. So it includes uh, Jeremy Ma, Maxim Vokovs, uh, Ilya Stanovich, Guang Yu, and myself. All right, so let's first get into the task at hand. So what is recognition and localization? So recognition, action recognition involves uh, basically identifying all the uh, action classes that occur in a video sequence. So a video is uh, obviously quite long. There can be multiple actions that take place. So this is typically a multi-class classification problem. Uh, and action localization is a little more specific. So action localization involves finding the boundaries of where the actions occur and what actions occur within those boundaries. So as an example in this picture, we have the boundary of alpine skiing starting from a frame A to frame B, and we need to identify where, where these boundaries are and what actions that happen in, this, in these boundaries. So I was talking about actions, but concepts in, uh, in the data set, YouTube ATEM data, data set, is a lot more general. So it can, be like a high, it can be a lot more high level. So it can be actions like skateboarding, dancing, but it, it can also be uh, more general entities such as uh, you know, acoustic guitar, wedding, and so on. So uh, I, I just put a picture of like a bunch of classes that are actually in the data set. So you can see things like music video, concert, dance. So they're very general. So, so that is what we're trying to identify. So before I get into uh, more details, let's take a look at uh, uh, let's take a look at the numbers of the data set. So the, the data set has 6.1 million videos. This is by far the far largest uh, video data set, and it has uh, over 3,000 uh, classes or concepts. Uh, and since it's a multi-class problem, each, uh, uh, each video has approximately uh, three labels, uh, three concepts. And also, like, the video is broken down logically into segments of five seconds. So these are called segments. Uh, so before I get into details, like I want to like uh, uh, make sure that you understand between video level labels and segment level labels. Video level labels are labels given to the entire video, whereas segment level labels are labels given specifically within the segment of length five seconds. Also in the data set, uh, the frames are sampled at one hertz. So basically for every second, we have one image frame that is sampled. All right, so getting into a little more details, out of the 6.1 million images, uh, uh, videos, we have about 47,000, which is a tiny fraction of them, uh, uh, having segment level labels. So these are both positive and negative labels. So positive labels are basically labels where the actions actually occur in that segment, and negative labels are where the actions don't occur in that segment, and we have a good balance of these, approximately 50-50. So that's what we're dealing with. So now the task of localization, is basically to localize actions within segments, or concepts within segments. So we need to classify each of these segments uh, into a bunch of concepts. So that is the task at hand. So the evaluation that, we have been, uh, that I'll be talking about, all the models are evaluated on mean average precision at 100,000. Uh, so all the results that I'll be showing you later on will be on this metric. So if you guys are not familiar with uh, MAP, so MAP is calculated by basically retrieving the top 100, oh, so MAP at 100,000 is calculated by retrieving the top 100,000 uh, candidate segments for each class, calculating the average precision for that class, and then taking a mean across all classes. So that's how we get MAP. All right, so let's get into the fun stuff. So how is feature extraction done on the data set? So preliminary feature extraction is done as follows. So we take each image frame from the video and pass it through a publicly available inception network, which is pre-trained on ImageNet. And we cut it off at some point, and then we finally do principal component analysis to reduce the dimensions to 1024. So what this does is it gives a fixed length representation for every image in the video. So now if a video is of n seconds, we have n images, and we can represent this entire video with the n by 1024 matrix. So this forms the input to all the other models that I'll be talking about. So these are the initial representations of the video. All right, so let's talk about concept recognition. 
So concept recognition, like I told you, is to classify the entire video segment, uh, entire video into a bunch of classes. So some of the popular methods in the literature are LSTMs, transformers, connets, and Vlad and Fisher vector-based approaches. Obviously, LSTMs and transformers form a very natural choice for modeling temporal relations. Uh, uh, and similarly, Vlad is very common in action recognition literature. So at a very high level, let's go through how we can probably uh, model such, uh, such a problem. So let's say we have an LSTM. We, we input the fixed length representation that we get out of ImageNet and after dimensionality reduction, we unroll the LSTM, get the final hidden layer, and then have a classification head that classifies into uh, all the classes that we are uh, interested in. So then we can train this using a simple n-way uh, binary cross entropy loss. And uh, it's an n-way loss because uh, we want multi-class labels, right? So let's take a look at Vlad, but again, at a very high level, I'll just gloss over it. So in Vlad, you have a bunch of cluster centroids, and your features that are coming out of Vlad are basically distances from these cluster centroids aggregated. So if you can think of the cluster centroids as holding some high-level information, your feature coming out of, of, uh, in, uh, of LAD is basically the differences or distances from these cluster centroids. So those form actually uh, very good features, but LAD is not differentiable because you have a hard assignment. Uh, NetVlad tries to replace the hard assignment with a soft assignment. Uh, and learn the cluster centroids and the parameters of these soft assignments together. But I'll just gloss over it. We can chat about it more if you're interested uh, later. So this is like the high-level overview of any model, actually. You have a bunch of, like, uh, you have an n by 1024 uh, matrix as features that are getting into the model. You have a net flat encoding layer. You can replace that with a transformer encoding, or LSTM encoding, or what have you. And you have a final classification head, and these can be trained using uh, N-way binary cross entropy loss. But until now, we've been looking at recognition as a whole, where we classify the entire video uh, into a bunch of uh, concepts. How do we do localization, right? So the localization, invo I mean, uh, localization involves classifying these segments into classes. But the ma so you can do something similar to what we had done before. Instead of N by 1024, we can do, we can pass a phi by 1024 which are the uh, representations of the segment. But the main challenge is that you have only 47,000 videos that have their segments labeled, whereas you have 4 million plus videos in the training data set that have their videos labeled. So it's kind of like a waste to throw away uh, all these 4 million and then just train on like a tiny fraction of 47,000. So what do we do? Uh, uh, the idea is pretty simple. We do something like weak supervision and fine tuning. So, uh, so the idea here is we first train a network on the video level with the video level auxiliary labels. That's why I call it weak supervision. And then we fine tune them on the small subset of the data set that where we actually have labels for the, sub, uh, of, for the segments. So the way we do it, let's say for in the LSTM's case, is again, you train this LSTM on the video level labels on like, let's say millions of videos. And then you copy the parameters of the LSTM and the fully connected classification layer to make it predict for each segment. So here, cell zero, cell one, and until cell five form the first segment. And then we can, we can train this network uh, by fine tuning on the small uh, labeled subset of the data set. So first, let's take a look at pre preliminary uh, results, right? So we can see, so these are all the models that we've tried. Uh, if you guys want to really uh, know more details about each of these models, uh, you can talk to me later. But at, on the whole, you can see that the MAP is pretty good, but not really that, uh, it's not a great score for this task. So let's see how we can make it better. And uh, our best performing model is CCRL, which is cross-class relevance learning. I'll, I'll talk about it in a bit. So how do we make this even better, right? So I'll draw parallels from uh, a two-stage object detector. So in a two-stage object detector like faster RCNN, you have the first stage that predicts, uh, which is a region proposal layer, which predicts bounding box proposals, and then the second stage layer, which, which does further fine tuning on these bounding box uh, proposals and also does uh, bounding box classification. 
So the premise here being the first stage should give all possible bounding boxes. So it should be a very high recall uh, model which predicts all possible bounding boxes. And then the second stage can further refine this and make this more precise so the precision can go higher. So can we do something like that for videos where we have a network that predicts most likely, uh, you know, with a high recall, most likely candidates for each class, and then we can use other models to further refine them further. So that's the idea. So the way we do this is, uh, to motivate this further, let's see why we need to do this, right? So for a given class C, right, uh, let's take a look at the total search space uh, for this class. So there are 2.2 million segments. Those are like these small video clips within uh, uh, larger videos that are, that are present in the uh, test set. So for every class, we are, there are 2.2 contenders that can possibly belong to this class. And that's a very large subs, uh, subset, right? uh, uh, search space. So how about we use a high recall model to further reduce the search space uh, down? So basically what we want to do is here, uh, the, the green dots represent all the class, all the segments that actually belong to a class, and the red dots, which, which arguably are a lot more than green, are, are, are don't belong to that class. Uh, so we need to use a model to reduce the search space down, as, as well as retain all the green dots in, that, uh, in its search space. So then we can use another high precision model to further fine tune this. So that's pretty much what we do. So at a very high level, uh, let's say, so we use a state-of-the-art uh, video-level classifier uh, fr uh, I've, from Scali et al. 2018 to classify all the videos to classes. So here we have video zero, video one to video three, and each of the blocks within video represents segments. So for this class, we have uh, uh, the probabilities that this model predicted so that means that this, so for video zero, this model thinks that there's a 0.7 chance that this class actually belongs uh, inside this video. So then we, we can sort them, and then we can take the most, I mean, we can take the top, uh, you know, top videos. And then all the segments within those videos form contenders or, or candidates for this class C. So this, what this does is it reduces the pool of search space down to a much smaller, uh, by a factor of 20 actually in our case. So, so now we have, for every class, we have a pool of s candidate segments that are very likely to actually belong to that class. So now we actually, we actually measure the recall for this and then it's a near perfect recall, 99.7. So that, 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 that means that we are not actually losing out on uh, uh, we're not losing out on uh, much by reducing the search space down because we have a near-perfect recall. So we can see later on that this gives us a 5 to 14 percent boost uh, in MAP, which is a significant boost. Uh, so that is first stage. So first, what we do is in stage one, we use uh, a state-of-the-art model to reduce the search space down. Now we can use all the models that I've talked about to predict the class likelihoods uh, on, on, on each of these segments coming out from the pool. So, so I, I've talked about a bunch of models like Comnets, LSTMs, Transformers, and NetFlags. These are very common in action rec uh, recognition literature. And we also have another model called CCRL, which is cross-class relevance learning, uh, and which is our best performing model. So to motivate why we needed this model, I will talk about how, what happens in like a normal baseline classifier like the ones in the existing, class, uh, existing approaches. So you have a segment, which is a small video clip. We extract features of the segment. We pass it through, let's say, a gigantic neural net. And then we have an N-way classifier, right? But uh, uh, when you have data sets that have like thousands of labels, uh, these labels are, uh, th these labels are, are bound to have some hierarchy and like some structure within them. So because this is like an in the wild data set, so uh, to motivate this further, we have, I I've plotted a T-SNE plot of the bag of words representation of the classes, and we can see that the classes cluster together. So we can see somewhere up, like there is kayaking, sailboat, and sailing that are clustered together. Similarly, we have some makeup products on the side, 
So, and there's a very high chance that these classes actually co-occur in the data set because it's a multi-class classification problem. And we want to take advantage of this structure in the classes. But if we, if we want to do this in the traditional approach, we need to design something like a hierarchical loss or some sort of weighting on losses, and this becomes really hard to train in practice, given the fact that this model is gigantic, has many tens of millions of parameters. So what we do is, instead of uh, making a model predict class likelihoods for all the classes, we have a joint model where we take segment features and a class embedding and then predict a joint uh, class uh, and segment likelihood uh, relevance, right? So this model takes the segment features and a class embedding uh, as a pair and then predicts the segment class relevance. In, in, the, in, the, in the example here, this, this segment was a clip of someone skiing and the class embedding is, let's say, skateboarding and they don't match together, so we would like the model to have a low uh, segment class relevance. Uh, but what this really opens up is uh, the opportunity to do arbitrary feature engineering. So now what we can do is we can actually encode uh, how these, uh, how one class, how a target class co-occurs with other classes. Uh, and we can actually do a lot more feature engineering ourselves. And then we can pass all this, these features as input and, and try to predict a joint uh, segment class relevance score. So another example is here, we have the class embedding of alpine skiing. And, and the segment is actually skiing, and we would want the model to predict a very high uh, segment class relevance. So that is CCRL on, on like a very high level. Uh, if you guys are more interested, you can check our uh, ICCV paper uh, in, uh, and also chat with me if you're interested in more details. But now let's take a look at the results. So when we take a look at the results, uh, we can see that there is a significant improvement just by using candidate generation for on each of these models. So you can see the most improvement came on transformer where the MAP went from 65.24% to 79.55%. Uh, and similarly, all the other models are about 80% and our best performing model, which is CCRL, is 80.91, uh, which is about 0.6% uh, higher than the uh, uh, next best model. So finally, I've, towards the end, like how do we ensemble these, uh, uh, these, we have a bunch of models and it makes sense to ensemble them to even make the performance go higher. Uh, for ensembling, we have a very simple procedure. So basically we take the models outputs, like the class likelihoods for each of the model and then uh, we do a simple averaging. And this is because some models are better on some classes, identifying some classes and some uh, on others are not. Uh, so each of these models complement well together and then uh, give a better score. We also do one last step for post-processing where we run a one-dimensional filter of equal weight on the video uh, so that we incorporate neighborhood uh, information as well as it has a smoothing effect on the outputs of the class probabilities. So let's take a look at the results. So we stand at the, we, have, we currently have state-of-the-art at 83.292 after ensembling, which is quite comfortable, which is a quite comfortable read, about 0.6% above the next best team. Uh, also contrasting with uh, our sing single model performances, we can see that just CCRL alone stands at fourth place, and also like uh, other single models stand around sixth or seventh place, and this is actually a very significant uh, uh, result because most of these models are gigantic ensembles, like at least 10 ensembles that go in together uh, on all the top 10 teams. So it's great to see that candidate generation just boosts the performance so that even single models stand at the top place. So that's pretty much my talk. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, also, I like, uh, just wanted to mention that uh, we from Layer 6 AI are actively hiring, so feel free to reach out. Uh, yeah, thanks. And we can open up for some Q&A. Uh, thanks for the talk. It was uh, very good work. I worked on uh, this problem before, and in literature, when we did literature, literature survey, we found this under the category of strong and weakly labeled right. uh, problem. I would be interested if uh, you have a paper on this, or if you can tell what paper you refer to for this work. 
uh, for this. Uh, like most of the state-of-the-art approaches in action recognition, like NetVlad, NextVlad, uh, other approaches that actually lead to the best performance on this data set in the previous year. I, I would, I'm happy to chat with that after. Okay. Can't think about it Thank you. Uh, at the current time. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, congratulations on winning the competition. Great work. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the class labels? I just uh, didn't understand. What were the features involved in, in the class label that you uh, did the... Class labels here? Yeah, right there. What, what is the class label? Is it a video representation? Or is so you can, you can do a lot of things. Like I, like I talked about, this opens up for like a lot of uh, uh, feature engineering. So you can take the bag of words representation of the class. You, in, uh, and also there's a higher level representation for the class called uh, verticals, which is like a higher group like a hierarchy on these classes, so you can encode them. You can, you can be encoded uh, how the co-occurrence of one class with another, and all these uh, just concatenated, normalized from the embedding for the class. Uh, so uh, could you explain why uh, original algorithm model uh, not influencing too much uh, to end result? So, so you want to know like why there is such a big boost? No, 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 not big boost. So see, you have like, 74, it changed to 80. Right. 76, changed to 80 again. Yeah. 65, changed to 79. So you s sort of have some unification of results, oh, which okay. is not expected, actually. OK, I, 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 I can probably give you an intuitive idea of why this happens, because most of these models actually typically fall around 70s. But now, uh, from the segment candidate generation process, we have eliminated a lot of them that are unlikely. Where most of these, uh, where most of these actually are, were failing. So once we eliminated the candidates that were not surely belonging to one class, we got a free boost on all these models. So just a quick clarification. So do you mean that that you eliminated a vulnerability and those models originally had varying degrees of that vulnerability, and that's why they had different scores before and the same score after? It's not like they have the same score after, but what what? So we have the same candidate generation uh, process for all the models. So the candidate generation process reduces down the sub, uh, search space. So now all the models over here are, perform uh, are taking this as input. Like for every class, the pool for that class as input. So, so that's why since we eliminated all the non-possible ones, and where most of these classes, uh, most of these models were actually failing, we got, we can see that most of these uh, models get pretty similar performance boosts. Hi, uh, I have a question about the step where you compute a score on the pair of the uh, uh, segment and the label. Right. Um, so how, so, so you, you, I, I assume you get a score for all possible uh, class Pairs. labels. Uh, this one? Yeah. So yeah, I get a score for every segment and class pair. Uh, okay, and so how, how do you pick the final set? So now that you have every segment class pair, uh, let's say you want to compute mean average precision. So you take one class, see its pair with every possible segment, and then take, take the top X, let's say, uh, candidates that fall uh, after your threshold. Uh, sorry, fall under what? So you can, you can take, ev so let's, let's say you were computing score for alpine skiing class. Yeah. You would take a pair with alpine skiing and all possible segments. Yeah. Uh, so you get like 0 0.9, 0 0.8, some scores. And then you can sort them and take the top few. Top 100,000, actually. OK, got it. Thank you. Yeah.